and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. Today's video is all about NFS, the network file system. So what I'm going to do is show you guys in this video how to set up your very own NFS server. But not only that, I'm also going to show you guys how to mount the shared directories from an NFS server on an NFS client as well. And you know what? I'm not done yet. In addition to that, I'll also show you guys AutoFS as well, which is really cool. What it allows you to do is set up an NFS client to mount an NFS export on demand rather than having it mounted all the time. So just follow along with me, and by the end of this video, you'll have your very own NFS server ready to go. And speaking of following along, a great way to do that is to set up your very own Linux server. Actually, you'll need two Linux servers, one for the server itself, the NFS server, and the other to act as the NFS client. And a great platform to do that on is Linode. Linode is the sponsor for this particular video, and I couldn't possibly be more thrilled. And if you're not already familiar with Linode, they're a cloud computing provider, but unlike all the others, Linode is completely focused on Linux. And that's why they're such a great fit to sponsor this channel. Linux is critical to my business because Learn Linux TV is all about Linux, and Linode is too. If you don't already have an account on Linode's platform, you can set one up using the URL that you see on the screen right now. And by using that URL, you can get your very own cloud server set up and running in minutes. And to help facilitate that, the URL will get you $100 in starter credit that you could use towards your new account. And you'll have two entire months to use up that credit. And since Linode has instances available for as low as $5 a month, you can literally spin up an entire army of Linux servers to do your bidding. Now, if you're at all particular about which Linux distribution your server should be running, there's actually a very good chance that your favorite distro is featured on Linode. Whether your favorite happens to be something like Debian, CentOS, Fedora, Ubuntu, or something else entirely, Linode has you covered. And you can set up your very own Linux server with that distribution and have it running in no time at all. And Linode is awesome. You could use their platform to set up your very own blog, maybe a Nextcloud server, or if you're not feeling particularly creative, you could just simply use them and their platform as a means by which to follow along with the countless tutorials that are available on Learn Linux TV. Anyway, thank you so much to Linode for sponsoring today's video. I really appreciate it. Anyway, I don't know about you, but I'm very excited to set up an NFS server, so let's just go ahead and get started. So what you're seeing right now is a screen capture directly from my notebook. I have a terminal window open, and inside that terminal window, I have an SSH connection to an Ubuntu server instance. Now this is just a vanilla Ubuntu server instance, so if you don't already have an Ubuntu server set up, then you can go ahead and create that. I have a video on my channel already that goes through the process. Again, you'll need two servers, one for the NFS server itself, and then the other as an NFS client. Now, I'll leave it up to you to set up two servers. You could use VirtualBox, that's perfectly fine. Physical servers, you could also spin up some instances on Linode, like I mentioned earlier. But again, I'll leave it up to you to get some servers going, and then we'll continue. So what you're seeing right now is a screen capture that's being captured directly from my notebook. And inside that terminal window, I have an SSH connection that's open to the server that's going to become the NFS server during the course of this video. This server in particular is running Ubuntu server, and that's what I recommend that you run as well. That's what I've tested all of these commands against. You can absolutely set up an NFS server on any distribution of Linux, but Ubuntu actually covers quite a bit of ground. There's all kinds of derivatives of Ubuntu, and there's Ubuntu server itself, and even Debian should work out just fine since Ubuntu is based on Debian. And more specifically, I'm running Ubuntu Server 2204, and that's what I recommend that you run as well if you plan on following along with me. And speaking of Ubuntu Server 2204, I wanted to take a moment to plug my latest book, Mastering Ubuntu Server 4th Edition, which actually covers Ubuntu 2204. As of the time I'm recording this video, it's in the final stages of the production process, but by the time you are seeing this edited video, it's already out and available for purchase right now. You could grab it over at ubuntuserverbook.com, and if you do check it out, please leave a review somewhere. That would really help me out. Now, first of all, what we're going to need is a base directory or parent directory for all of our NFS shares. What we're going to do is create some subdirectories within that parent directory, and each of those subdirectories will be NFS shares in and of themselves. So I'll create the first directory right now. 
and it's just going to be slash exports, as you see right here. And next we'll go inside that directory. As you can see, it's empty because I've just created it. But what I want to do right here is create a couple other directories. So I'll make a backup directory. Backing up files is always a good thing to do. And I'll create a documents directory as well, just as a random example. But you could create any directories that you want. Just make sure that anytime I refer to these directories, if you change the name of these directories on your end, that you make sure that everything is consistent. So as you can see, we have our two directories, and we also have the parent directory. Now having one parent directory isn't actually required, but it is a good practice. So now that we have those particular directories, the directories that we plan on sharing, we need a means by which to share those directories, and that's where NFS comes in. But the NFS server service is not actually installed right now, so let's take care of that. So what I'll do is install the package. I'll run sudo apt install. And the name of the package that we want to install is nfs hyphen kernel and then hyphen server, just like that. And as we can see right here, it's going to install a few dependencies. And if I press enter right here, I'm accepting the defaults and I'm okay with this, so I'll press enter. And now it's installing. And now the package is in fact installed. And now that we have that package installed, we actually have just created a real NFS server. Now, of course, we haven't set it up yet, but we do have an NFS server service running on the server, which actually meets the requirements to call this an NFS server. So congratulations, you do have an NFS server already. But the default configuration doesn't know anything about the directories that we plan on sharing. So let's go ahead and set that up. Just to make sure that everything is okay, what I'm going to do is check the status of the NFS service just to make sure that it's actually running and there's no problems. So I'll run systemctl and then status nfs hyphen kernel hyphen server. Now, as you can see right here, it is active, but it exited. It exited because there's nothing for it to share. We haven't configured anything for it to do. So it started, it looked at the Etsy exports file, and that's actually the text file that will list all of the directories inside of that we plan on sharing. But because we haven't actually added anything yet, well, like I said, there's nothing for the NFS server to do, so the service has exited. That's okay though, because we're going to configure that file right now. Now, before we actually configure the shares or the directories that we plan on sharing, let's take a look at the Etsy exports file before we make any changes, just to see what it looks like. And there it is. Technically, there's nothing inside this file. Well, there is, as you can see, there's various lines of text within this file, but the hash symbol in front of each line actually makes a line a comment, and comments are ignored. So since each of these lines actually begins with a hash symbol, then none of the text that you see right here does anything at all. Now what I'm going to do is just move this file to another name. I might want to retain this file in case any of the syntax that it shows here is actually useful to me later on down the road. So I'll just run sudo mv for move. We want to move the exports file. And what I want to do is move it to a different name, like I said. So I'll run sudo move etsy exports. And I'll move it to the same directory. But what I'll do is change the name just a little bit just to make it different. So I'll press enter. And now we no longer have an etsy exports file. But that's okay, because what we're going to do right now is create a fresh one. So I'll run sudo and then nano, then slash etsy slash exports, just like that. You could use whatever text editor you want to use. Nano is just a suggestion. It's the easier one to use between the most common text editors in Linux. But I'll leave it up to you if you want to use a different editor. So here we have the file. It's blank because we moved the file to a different name. So we're just starting fresh here. So as you can see, I've pasted in two lines here. Each one of these shares starts out with a path, the full path to the directory that you plan on sharing with that export. And then after that, you can include some options. And how you configure the options after the path determines how exactly that share can be accessed. So what I've done here is I've identified network 10.10.10.0. is a network identifier, not actually an IP address in this case, slash, and then a subnet mask. Now on your end, you'll definitely want to make sure that you change the subnet, the network address, to whatever yours happens to be. And the subnet that you add right here determines which host can actually connect to the NFS server 
and then access the directories that you share. You could make it wide open by just not including the IP address or subnet at all. I don't recommend it, but it is your server. But what I do recommend that you do is find out what your IP subnet actually is. You could just grab your IP address from any host on your network and then change the last octet to zero and that should actually get you guys where you need to be. If you do run into problems, you could just simply remove the network and subnet identifier like I've mentioned. But again, I recommend that you keep those in there and then you just configure this to match your particular environment. After the subnet, we see that we have some options in parentheses. Among those, we have RW, which you could probably guess means read-write. You could change that to RO for read-only if you don't want any changes to be made to the contents inside those directories. And then we also have the option no subtree check. And the no subtree check option disables the parent directory of the export for being a part of the file handle. I know that sounds complicated, but you don't really have to worry about that right now. I mean, it is a relatively advanced concept, but basically what we're doing is we're disabling subtree checking completely in favor of security because threat actors can actually use the parent directory information against us. Now, to put it even more simply, a shorter summary is that this particular option helps security a bit, and I recommend that you use it. So what I'm going to do right now is save this file. That's all we needed to do for this. So in the case of Nano, it's Control O and then Enter, and then Control X to exit out. And now we're back to the prompt. And believe it or not, we've actually finished setting up the NFS server. However, the changes that we've made to that file will not take effect until we actually restart the NFS server. So to do that, what I'll do is run sudo systemctl, and then restart, and NFS hyphen kernel hyphen server. Press enter. And then what we can do is check the status and make sure that it's actually running. If you remember last time, it ran, but then it exited because it had nothing to do. Well, we gave it something to do, so let's see if it's actually doing some work for us. And as you can see here, it's no longer complaining that the Etsy exports file doesn't contain anything useful, because it does actually contain useful information now. So it looks like everything was a success. So what I'm going to do right now is create some test files that'll help us prove that this is working. So what I'll do is just change the directory into the parent directory for NFS. We set that up as slash exports. And again, we have those two directories right there. So to create some test files, I'll just use nano. It's an easy way to do that. So I'll run sudo nano because technically root still owns these directories. My local user here does not have any capability of writing to anything inside these directories just yet. But I don't really care about that right now. Let's just go ahead and create those test files. So I'll just create the first one in the backup directory here. I'll just call it test1.txt. And inside that file, I'll just put hello world. And let's create the other one. We'll create it inside the documents directory this time. And I'll call it test2.txt. Inside there, I'll just type learn Linux TV, just like that. So now we have our test files. We can close out of the editor. And we should be all set when it comes to the server. So let's go ahead and move on to the client, the server that we're going to use to connect to the shares that are being shared from the NFS server. And here it is. I've cleverly named this NFS client. And let's go ahead and see what the process looks like for connecting to the shared directories. Now, the first thing that we're going to do here on the client is install NFS. But we're not going to install the NFS server package, the one that we installed before. We don't really need that. It'd be overkill in this case. What we'll do instead is install the NFS client package. So I'll just run sudo apt install and then NFS hyphen common. And that's the name of the package that represents the client and contains all of the utilities that you'll need to connect to an NFS share from another server. So I'll press enter and let it install. And that's it. Everything's all set when it comes to the NFS client. So the next thing that I recommend that you do is test connectivity to the server. And there's actually a dedicated command that you can use for that purpose. And that command is the show mount command. We can use this command to connect to a server and see which directories are being shared by NFS. But you will need the IP address of the server if you don't happen to know what it is already. And to find that out, you can just go back to the server 
And then you can run IP ADDR show just like that. And that'll give you the IP address. And mine in particular is 10.10.10.222. And now that we know what the IP address is of the server, we can continue. Well, actually, I already knew what mine was, but I wanted to make sure that you guys knew how to find out what yours is as well. Anyway, back here on the client, let's run the show mount command. We're going to type dash dash exports. And then we're going to type the IP address of the server. And if this works, what should happen is we should get a list of directories that are being shared by that server. If it doesn't work, then we must have done something wrong in the configuration, or perhaps there could even be a firewall involved. But let's press enter and see what happens. And check that out. It shows both of the directories right there that we've shared from the NFS server. And that can only mean that the NFS client has no problem at all when it comes to connecting to the NFS server. So we should be good to go to proceed. Now, similar to how we created a parent directory on the server to act as a starting point for any directories that we plan on sharing, we're going to do a similar thing here on the client. We're going to create a parent directory that's going to include subdirectories, and each one of those subdirectories will be attached to one of those shared directories from the server. So first, what I'll do is type sudo mkdir. And this time, underneath the slash mnt directory, I'm going to create a subdirectory. And the path to the parent directory for mounting is going to be slash mnt slash nfs. The slash mnt directory already existed. You already had that on your file system. We didn't need to create that. But we're going to use the nfs directory underneath that directory to mount our directories underneath. Now what I'll do is create subdirectories, and each of these will be named the same as the directory that's being shared. I just like to keep things consistent. You don't have to keep the name the same, but I think it's a good idea. And the first one was the backup share. So I'll press enter on that. And then I'll do the same thing again. This time I'll create the documents directory here. And as you can see, we have the two directories right there. But currently, these directories are empty, and that's because we haven't actually mounted anything yet. These are just normal empty directories. So let's go ahead and see how we go about mounting an NFS export. So what I'll do is run sudo mount, and then the IP address of the server, which in my case is 10.10.10.222, and then colon, then you type a full path to the share on the server, the path that's on the server, not the local path, but the server's path to the directory that we want to mount. And again, that was slash exports. And the first one was the backup directory. And we want to mount that underneath slash MNT slash NFS slash backup. Now, if I run DF dash H, we can see at the end there that the mount NFS backup directory that's actually being shared from my NFS server is mounted here locally. And if you don't believe me, check it out. We have test1.txt right there. That's the exact same file that we created as a test from the server. And as you can see, it actually has the text inside that I added to the file. So we definitely know that NFS is working. So let's go ahead and mount the other directory. So I've just recalled the command that we've used to mount the backup directory, because I just don't want to type all of that again. And I'll just update the path accordingly. We called it documents. And I'll make sure it matches here at the end as well. So the documents export is now mounted. And we have our test file. And it includes the text that we've added. So if I didn't know any better, I would say that both of these particular shared directories work just fine. So how do you go about unmounting these particular exports if you are, well, finished with them and you no longer need them? Well, what you could do is run sudo and then you mount, and then the path to the directory where you mounted the export to So what we'll do is unmount the backup directory. And let's do the same thing to the documents directory as well. And if this worked, then neither of these should be mounted anymore. So let's see. And they're gone. 
So now what I'm going to do is show you guys how to have these particular mounts automatically mounted by something called AutoFS. AutoFS is really cool. It's actually one of my favorite utilities because what it allows you to do is have these mounted on demand. And you might be wondering, why does that matter? Well, NFS does legitimately have some locking issues that sometimes creep up. So by using an on-demand system, I find that it works better. And the beauty of AutoFS is that it mounts things so quickly that any app that might be expecting to find that those directories are mounted won't even have any idea that they ever weren't mounted. So let's go ahead and see how we set up AutoFS to automatically mount these exports. So first of all, what I'll do is just navigate to the slash MNT slash NFS folder here. That's where we have our subdirectories. And what I'm going to do is actually remove those subdirectories. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because AutoFS takes care of that for us. It'll make sure that those directories exist. But before we actually go about removing anything, what we'll definitely want to make sure that we do is just double check that nothing is mounted. Because if we run the rm command against something that is mounted, we might risk losing the contents of that particular export. And we definitely don't want that, especially if we had something important saved inside that directory. In my case, neither of those are mounted, so we can continue. So again, we have the backup directory and the documents directory right here. So what I'm going to do is just run sudo rm-r, and I'll do that against the backup directory as well as the documents directory. And now neither of those directories exist here on the file system. Because again, AutoFS will take care of that for us. We don't really need to be in charge of creating directories. Let's just let AutoFS handle it. So I'll just go back to the home directory here and we'll continue. Let's set up AutoFS. And to do that, what we'll do is run sudo apt install. The package for AutoFS is simply called AutoFS. And that's it. It's already installed. And as you can see, it's actually running. That's really cool. But we still don't have anything mounted yet. And that's because AutoFS actually needs to be configured. In fact, there's two config files that we'll need to edit to make this work. The first one is the auto.master file. So what we'll do is run sudo nano and then slash etsy and then auto.master. And that's actually the primary config file for AutoFS. It's the first file that it reads when it starts up. So we definitely want to make sure that we edit this particular file. Now, first of all, we have quite a bit of text here. We don't really need to worry about any of this. We just need to go to the end of the line. And I'll just add another line to add some separation. What we're going to do is add our configuration right here on this line. And we only have one line that we need to edit for this file. So this one's going to be pretty easy. So first of all, what I'll do is type slash MNT slash NFS. And this right here is the exact same directory that we created as our base directory for mounting NFS exports. Definitely want to make sure that this matches. After that, we're going to call attention to another file. So I'll type slash Etsy slash auto dot NFS. This is a file that already exists on the file system. The auto.master and the auto.nfs files were created for us when AutoFS itself was installed. So what we're doing right here by adding this particular path to this file is we're telling AutoFS to make sure that it looks at this file for the different mounts that we want to be a part of the NFS config that we have here. And anything that's included in the auto.nfs file is going to be mounted underneath the slash mnt slash nfs directory. Next, we're going to give it a few more options here. So the first one is dash dash ghost. And the second one is dash dash timeout. And I'll set that equal to 60 seconds. The ghost option in particular creates the directories, basically ghost directories, that'll exist inside the parent directory and it'll make sure that those directories already exist right there inside that parent directory. That's important because if a program or process goes to look for any of the directories that are supposed to be mounted, it at least needs to find the subdirectory. And if it doesn't find it, it could, well, fail. We don't want that. So the ghost option will just make sure that those directories exist. The timeout option that I have here, which I've set to 60 seconds, what that does is that instructs AutoFS to unmount any NFS shares that haven't been accessed or touched for that number of seconds. And that actually adds to its dynamic nature. So it's a good option to have. 
especially if you have a server that goes offline, then the client is only going to wait 60 seconds before it gives up. Otherwise, it could just try forever and then, well, freeze. We definitely don't want that. But that's about all for this particular file, so I'll save it. And let's move on to the next file. And actually what I'll do is just paste in the lines of code that we'll need to have inside this file. Again, you can check out the blog post for this video, which will have all of this in there. And there we go. So as you can see here, I have two mounts identified that I want AutoFS to keep track of. And each of these lines corresponds to one of the exports that we've created on the server. I'll go ahead and break it down. Now the first line is actually for the backup export. So at the very beginning, I'm actually naming this backup. But this might be a bit confusing at first, so it's important to understand that backup right here does not correspond to the name of the directory on the server, but instead it corresponds to what we want the directory to be called on the client when it's mounted. And this directory, in this case backup, will be created underneath the parent directory that we've identified in the Etsy auto.master file. So the name doesn't technically have to match, but I recommend that you make it match because it just makes sense. I just like everything to be as consistent as it possibly can be. But to be fair, where you see backup right here, you could have called this turtles or something and it would be fine. Whatever you name it right here is what the subdirectory or the ghost directory is going to be named inside the parent directory. Next, we're setting the file system type it's NFS4 in this case. Then we have a comma followed by RW for read write. So on the server, you could set read write or read only, but on the client, you could also do the same. So for example, if I was to set this to read only right here, the server itself is allowing changes, but the client will not be allowing changes if I set it to RO or read only. So basically I can refuse changes from the server level as well as the client level. But in this case, I'm just going to leave it as RW just to keep everything consistent. Next, we have an IP address that goes to the server that contains the directories that we wish to mount. After that, we have a colon and then the full path to the directory on the server where the actual export is located. So if you recall, we created our shares under the slash exports directory. That's what I have right here. And then the directory itself that we're sharing out. And that's really all there is to it. So to help make sure that you guys really understand this, what I'll do is show you the relevant lines of config from both of the files at the same time. So I'll type tail dash N and then one. I wanna show the last one line of the file that I'm about to type. And that's the Etsy auto.master file. And now we see the final line of that file. Then I'll just cut out the contents of the auto.nfs file. There's only two lines in there anyway, so I don't really need to use the tail command for that. And there we have that config. And I think this actually makes it make more sense when it comes to how these two files relate to each other. Again, the auto.master file is the very first file that autofs reads when it starts up. When it reads this file, what it's going to find is this line right here. So we're setting the slash mnt slash nfs base directory. And under that directory is where all of the mounts are going to be, well, mounted. We're going to have subdirectories underneath that directory. So slash mnt slash nfs, again, that's the base directory. Now, if we take a detour and go down to the other file, the auto.nfs file, you can see we have backup and documents. So what's going to happen is that these particular shares will be mounted underneath the mount NFS directory. So for example, backup will be slash MNT slash NFS slash backup. And then of course the same for documents. And that's basically how the two are matched together. Anyway, now that we have the configuration in place, let's restart AutoFS. First of all, for a quick sanity check, we have nothing mounted when it comes to NFS, as you can see here. When I run the DF command, it's not showing anything mounted for NFS at all, which is great because we've unmounted everything and that's expected. So let's go ahead and restart AutoFS. 
And I didn't get any errors, but let's just make sure that everything is fine. Let's check the status. And as you can see, it's running. So, so far, everything looks fine, right? Well, let's see. Well, wait a minute. Nothing's mounted. Nothing's changed, like, at all. In fact, if I run mount and then I grep for NFS, we see AutoFS itself, but we don't see anything mounted. What's going on? Well, like I alluded to earlier, when it comes to AutoFS, it doesn't mount anything until you go to access something. So let's just go ahead and list the storage for slash MNT slash NFS. Again, that's our base directory. And we have our two directories there, the ones that we removed earlier. Because we added the ghost option, that told AutoFS to make sure that those directories are actually in existence. And now they are. Let's run df-h again. Wait a minute. Both of those are mounted. But what's interesting is that I didn't list the storage of the backup or documents directories. I only listed the storage of the NFS directories. Well, actually, all you really have to do is just list the master directory here, and it mounts everything underneath it automatically, right then and there. So as soon as I listed the storage for slash MNT slash NFS, that caused AutoFS to kick into action, and it made sure that those two directories are mounted. Now, earlier, I mentioned that in 60 seconds, they become unmounted. Well, they're still mounted right now, but you know what? Every time I do this, where I run df-h, that actually resets the counter. I had a 60 second timeout for these directories. And again, every time I run this, the 60 seconds starts over. And the reason why that's the case is because when you run df-h, it's reporting on information from the server. It's telling you how much space is used. It's telling you how much space is available as well. And it can only get that information from the server, so it's, of course, going to mount those directories. But they're still mounted. Well, like I said, it's just going to keep starting over every time I run that command. But how do we know that it was actually unmounted? I mean, we don't want to just take its word that it's going to unmount everything for us. We want to make sure that it's working. Check this out. I'm running the watch command, and what you should see as soon as 60 seconds elapses from the last time these mounts were accessed, they should just, well, disappear. So I'll just keep my eye on it here. I'll have to edit the video and maybe cut some time off so you guys don't have to wait too long. But we'll see these actually get dropped here very shortly. And check that out. They dropped. They just vanished. Well, that's because the 60 seconds has actually elapsed. And then AutoFS did exactly what we told it to do, and it made sure that those directories are not mounted. If I run the df-h command again, we can see that it's not listed there either. And the thing is, the reason why it's not listed now is because these directories were not mounted when I ran the command, which means by running df-h it doesn't have to pull any information from the NFS exports because they're not mounted, so now they're completely unmounted. And again, I'll list the storage. But you can see how there was a bit of a delay when it comes to using the ls command because it had to mount that particular directory. But here we have the documents directory mounted, but we don't have the backup directory mounted. Well, in this case, I specifically called for the documents directory underneath slash mnt slash nfs. And that, of course, caused autofs to mount only that directory. Now, when you list the storage of the base directory and you use the dash L option, that's actually pulling information. Anything that pulls information is going to trigger a mount. But here, I actually referred to the documents directory itself. So it was only concerned with that. And that's why that one got mounted and the other one didn't. Again, if I run the ls dash L command against the MNT slash NFS directory, it's going to make sure that both of those are mounted. And part of the reason for that is because by listing the storage of the parent directory, they're also pulling information from the subdirectories as well, which of course is going to trigger a mount. 
But all of that aside, we legitimately have an actual NFS server. And not only that, we have a client using AutoFS to make sure that any time information is needed from those shares, that those shares are automatically mounted. And that's really cool. And you know what? That brings us to the end of this video. That was a lot of fun. We worked on quite a bit today. We set up our very own NFS server. We mounted the shares from that server and then we set up AutoFS. So definitely let me know what your thoughts are in the comments down below. I can't wait to read what you guys have to say. And I have some awesome tutorials coming very soon. So make sure you subscribe. And also, if you like this video, please click that like button because that lets YouTube know that you wanna see more content just like this. And who knows? Maybe this NFS video will then be delivered to more people. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next video.